kitchen, right? I am, <clears throat> I'm not that old, but I am old enough to remember that a few times. Of course, what was worse than a switch when I was a kid was um, <clears throat> Sears. You know, when Sears was still the everything store, you know, they had the, the paint department and they had these paint stirrers that had holes in them, you know, and they weren't exactly flat. They were just slightly curved. <clears throat> Mama got a hold of those things. That's, those things should have been outlawed. I'm just saying <clears throat> those, those would sting like crazy. So, you know, there was one in the kitchen and one in mom's purse. And, um, you know, um, it was at grandmama's house where there was talk of cutting a switch, you know, cutting your own switch, you know. So anyway, good morning to you. I, uh, I thought about trying to fake the same drawl that Russell Jones has, but uh, I can't do it. And you guys wouldn't buy it anyway. So, but uh, it was just, uh, I, I didn't find out till Friday evening. Um, about you know needing to switch so anyway thank the Lord for um, working it all out but uh, if you came because Russell was coming I hope you'll stay for today anyway but uh, I'm going to invite you to turn to 2 Chronicles 36 if you would 2 Chronicles 36 2 Kings 25 is kind of the, the two parallel passages we're going to look at today um Brother Lucan is, um, he's back in, at school, but uh, <laughs> he, he ended up having a, a little bout with kidney stones. Some of you may have been through that, so I told him there was easier ways to get an extra day off um, if he needed an extra day off from work, you know, but um, I think he's past the worst of it now and uh, on the mend, but that's not, not a fun way to uh, shorten your days, but you know. This weekend, we have a few students coming in at Ambassador um, this week, the ones that are working on campus and maintenance and cafeteria and things like that. They'll start coming in and getting things fired up. Um, tomorrow morning, we actually start uh, a summer school module, a one-week intensive where it's 8 to 5 every day for a week, and you get all the class hours in the same as you would over 15 or 16 weeks in a semester, um, and then they just have to do the the work after class, reading and papers and whatever else goes with the course. So we'll have some students in this week for that. And then this Friday, um, which is the 18th, that's our move-in day for the rest of the students that are living on campus. So if you think about uh, Ambassador and think about um, travel safety uh, for the students, there's a lot of them that will be heading towards North Carolina you know, over the next uh, several days. So. One of our um, missionaries that is out of our church in North Carolina, his daughter is a student, and I saw them last night. They pulled in. They're staying at our... We have a, we have a mission house similar to the parsonage here. Our pastor has a house in town, so we use it for our, our missionaries because we have several, and they pulled in last night. So but they, they were in Missouri seeing uh, her family. They went down to Mississippi where their daughter had stayed for the summer with a, a friend from school and, and got a job there. And so Friday they drove from Missouri to Mississippi. Saturday they drove Mississippi to North Carolina. So um, <clears throat> there's there will be a lot of that going on you know, over the next uh, several days. So appreciate your prayers for that. So, All right. Um, when I have done Sunday school, I have done, you know, done a little bit of, you know, selective from, you know, the kings in the Old Testament. But today I want to do kind of a um, a wrap up with I think some things that are applicable. Um, if you had told me um, when I got married and you know we're our first child is a couple of years old, if you had told me by the time my daughter was 11 or 12 years old that uh, the Supreme Court in the United States would find a way to say that same-sex marriage was okay, I would have told you you were nuts. You know, if you'd told me that, um, you know, homosexuality would not just be the on TV, but it would be pushed and promoted and, and um, you know, what they're trying to do is normalize it. You know, and in fact, you know, marginal. I would have told you you're crazy. There's no way that America would take that. Um, and obviously, those things are coming around in our society today. 
But I say that as an introduction point because sometimes we think, okay, it's never been this bad ever. Now, it may not have been that way in our lifetimes, but there are times when it has been that bad or worse for God's children before. And just because things look like they're spinning out of control or they look like, boy, you know, um, God's forgotten about us, that's not the case. But uh, in 2 Chronicles 36, you see here, um, this, it, these events happen. If you see the last two verses of chapter 35, you see that's the death of Josiah. Okay, so towards the end of the kingdom of Israel, as they knew it, there were two good kings, you know, several years apart, 40, 70 years apart, something like that. But you had Hezekiah, who led a great revival. And then you had Josiah, who again reinstituted the Passover and led a great revival and tried to get rid of the idolatry and that kind of thing. But by the time of Hezekiah, God had already told Judah that they were going to be judged for their sin. By the time of Josiah, God had already told him, all right, you're done. I'm going to judge you for all of this, uh, for all the sins of Manasseh and everything. And yet God still gave him a little bit more time. So Josiah had about 40 years, I think, 41 years that he served the Lord and tried to do what's right. But after Josiah, if I could say it this way, it all fell apart from a human perspective. Or from God's perspective, I would say it this way. What God said he was going to do, he did. And that's the way to look at it. Okay, What God said he was going to do, he did. You had a couple in uh, the first part of Second Chronicles 36. You had a couple of um, very short um, reigns. You had two or three guys that reigned a year or two each. And it was only... You know, a handful of years, maybe five years, you know, seven years at the most, depending on which Bible historian you look at. And after the death of Josiah, that a fellow by the name of Nebuchadnezzar came in leading the armies of Babylon. Now, for a time, Nebuchadnezzar was leading the armies, but his dad was the king. Okay, well, we know Nebuchadnezzar as the king from what book of the Bible? Where where we see that name other than Kings and Chronicles? Say it louder. Daniel. Daniel. Yeah, yeah, that's the right answer. And we know that Daniel was the, was um, carried away captive, and Nebuchadnezzar was the king. But Nebuchadnezzar came with the armies of Babylon. They came in and they captured Jerusalem, and that's what's going on in um, Second Chronicles thirty six. Um, Notice with me down in verse number 11 of 2 Chronicles 36. Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign. He reigned eleven years. He did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord his God and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. He also rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck, hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. So Josiah died, his son became king, he only lasted a couple of years, and then Nebuchadnezzar comes in. They conquered Jerusalem. But Babylon's pattern was, if you behave, we'll let you stay where you are. Okay. When the northern kingdom was conquered, they, the northern kingdom was conquered by which world empire? That's extra credit. Anybody know? Assyria. Okay, Assyria, which was where you know, Nineveh was. Um, both of those would be in the modern day Iraq, Iran geography. Okay, Assyria was further to the north. It's not that Assyria is not the same country as Syria that is due north of Israel. Okay, you got Syria and Jordan that are due north of Israel. Assyria, all right, from your perspective, Assyria would be north and east, kind of at the top end of what we would call the Fertile Crescent on that, that part of your Bible map. Okay? But Assyria had conquered the northern um, tribes of Israel. Their policy was we are going we don't want any, we're not taking any chances. We don't want any um, rebellion or disruption from you. So when they came in, they took people and they uprooted them and they put them somewhere else. So you might be with a few family members, but you weren't with your entire community. The thinking was, 
if we separate them out, they're less likely to be able to work together and come up with a rebellion. I mean, isn't that the same thing that God did in Genesis chapter 10 and 11? Remember there were some people that got together and said, we're going to build a tower and it's going to go all the way to heaven and all that. And God looked at it and said, hey, nothing that they've decided to do is going to be withheld from them unless I interrupt this. And so he divided the languages out and they kind of scattered by groups. But when they were all united and sharing a common purpose, they, they were going to accomplish a lot. Well, that's kind of what Assyria was doing. God said, all right, I'm going to separate you so you can't do what I don't want you to do. Well, Assyria, their philosophy was kind of the same thing. We're going to take you and we're going to break all these conquered peoples up into smaller groups so you can't work together and form a rebellion against the, our empire. And so they would, they would mix and match. They would, they'd conquered multiple places, so they'd take people from here and, and transplant them here, and they'd take them here and replant them over here, you know, and just kind of mix it all up. When the kingdom divided, and you had the north and the south, you had Israel and Judah. Anybody remember what the capital of the north was? The capital of the south was always Jerusalem. The capital of the north was a city that you read about even in the time of Jesus in the New Testament. Samaria. Remember, Jesus must needs go through Samaria, and he talked to the woman at the well. And Well, that was Samaria. That was in the northern part. There was a well-known wicked king that made Samaria the capital. His wife is probably more well-known. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Yeah, Adam Jezebel. Yeah. So it was during the time of Ahab that Samaria became the capital. Okay, so that was the capital city of the north. But when the Assyrians conquered them, they took everybody out of the capital city and they transplanted people from other countries and put them back in there. That is why in the time of Jesus, people despised the Samaritans. I mean, the Samaritans were those that lived there in Samaria. But, you know, over time, those transplanted people had intermarried with the Jews that had been left there. A few of them had been left. And so it was a, an intermarriage situation. And they said, well, God made promises to our people. And, you know, you have, you're, you have a share, but you're not, you know, uh, the same as us. That's, that wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't the way God wanted them to look at the Samaritans, but that's just what they did. Okay, but I'm saying all that to try to help us connect some dots, hopefully, that you have Assyria and they mixed everybody up. That's why you had the Samaritans that were looked on differently in the New Testament. When Babylon came in about 150 years later, so Assyria conquered uh, the north and Samaria around 722 B.C. Babylon came in the first phase of the Captivity by Babylon was 605 BC, so about 115 years later. Okay, the final phase was 586 BC, which is why I say 130, 150 years. But anyway, when Babylon came in, their philosophy was: if you behave, we'll let you stay here. Okay, if I'm conquered, I, I think I'd prefer that one, right? All right, I'll be a good boy if you let me stay at my house and sleep in my bed and stick with my farm and that kind of thing. Well, what they did in 605 when they first captured was they carried away the best of the people, the princes and the king's children and the smart kids. How do I know that? Daniel chapter 1. Turn over there with me. Daniel chapter 1. See, a lot of times we think, okay, well, the things in Daniel happened way after Chronicles because it, ha it uh, is placed way later in our Bible. That's not the case. The things in the book of Daniel happened at the same time as the end of 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings and before Ezra and Nehemiah. I mean, as far as time, that's when it happened, right? Did I stall long enough? Did you find Daniel chapter 1? Okay, in the third year, chapter 1, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Jerusalem and besieged it. 
And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried to the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels in the treasure of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel. All right, here's the list. The king's seed, those that are descendants of the royal family, the princes, children in whom was no blemish, well favored, skillful in wisdom, cunning in knowledge, understanding science, such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. All right, now, you know the rest of the story where Daniel and his friends requested not to eat what was offered to idols and that kind of thing. But I want to just concentrate on verses 3 and 4 because that's in um, 2 Chronicles 36 when Nebuchadnezzar first came in. These are the ones that they carried away and Daniel was part of that. Daniel was part of that group that got carried away. Okay, so they took the king's children and the children of the princes, and that's why I said the smart kids, the ones that they could teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans, so the ones that were um, going to be leaders. Babylon's philosophy was, we want to get the younger generation, we're going to train them to be like Babylon, and then they'll go back and they'll teach their people to be Babylonian. Does that sound like a philosophy that's happened in America over the last 70 years? Hey, we'll just teach the young people and try to convert them and you know in a, in a few generations. And I mean that's not a hundred percent across the board, but that's how a lot of changes have happened in the United States, right? Radicals getting into the colleges at first, and then those graduates become teachers in the high schools, and, and over generations that kind of ideology is passed down with, you know trusting parents until they realized hey this isn't what they said it was and it isn't what it used to be and we got to pay more attention to this you know that was the start of the Christian school movement in the 70s and 80s right oh okay there's been a change in the education system and we don't want our kids indoctrinated like that but that was Babylon's philosophy we're going to take the the, um, the leadership and we're going to take them we're going to train them in, in the universities of Babylon and in the king's house in Babylon and then we're going to send them back and they're going to think Babylon's the greatest thing ever they're going to be loyal to Babylon they're going to teach their people to be Babylonian and it's all going to be great that was the, that was the approach there that was the philosophy so what happened is Nebuchadnezzar came in and took those out Historians say that somewhere in that timeline, not long after he initially conquered Jerusalem, he got called back to Babylon, and it was because his father was sick, and his father ended up passing away. So he became king, and uh, you know took on that role. But the first round, if I could say it that way, of Babylonian captivity was about 605 BC. Well, then you had about eight years in 597 BC they came back and took some more okay now did you I'm back in um, 2nd Chronicles 36 now look at verse number 12 speaking of Zedekiah he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and humbled not himself before who Jeremiah the prophet okay so who else lived during this exact same time Jeremiah the prophet. You know, if you take the end of 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings and, and lay it side by side with the book of Jeremiah on the historical parts of it, you see a lot of overlap. Okay? So Jeremiah was there. Do you, do you remember from Jeremiah chapter 1 what God told Jeremiah his ministry was going to be like? He said, I've called you and I've ordained you to be a prophet to the nations to root out and to pluck up and to tear down. And he said, I'm going to send you to people and they're not going to listen. <laughs> I mean, God told him that right at the very beginning. Well, here you see some of that coming to pass. Jeremiah went and told people exactly what God had said. And they're like, yeah, no. We're not doing that. Um... But Jeremiah lived through all of this. If you compare the book of Jeremiah, you see there were times when he was thrown into prison. You, you may remember a, a time when Jeremiah was in prison and a family member came to him and said, hey, would you, 
redeem this piece of land to keep it in the family and that was set up in the Mosaic law and the laws of Israel so that they could keep their inheritance that God had given them. They had a, a mechanism to keep it in the tribe, in the family. And he was in jail and he had been prophesying that Babylon was coming. And, and so from a human standpoint, all right, I'm in jail and God's been telling me that an enemy is going to come and conquer us. From a human standpoint, is that a good investment? Hey, let me buy this piece of property <laughs> so Babylon can take it away from me in a couple of years. From a human standpoint, that's a dumb decision. But God told him, you do it and you buy it and you get witnesses and then you take a copy of the paperwork and you put it in a, a safe place to be preserved as a testimony to the fact that yes, Captivity's coming just like God said, but God's also going to bring Israel back to this land just like he said. And so Jeremiah did. From a human standpoint, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But from God's perspective and as a picture of what he was going to do, God wanted that as a visual illustration. Okay, But I'm saying that to say Jeremiah lived through all this, but in some of those cases when Jeremiah was in prison, it wasn't because of Babylon. You know who put him in prison? Who's that? Jews. Yeah, the Jews. The, the kings of Judah that didn't want to hear what he had to say, right? We don't like what you're saying. You're, you're saying Babylon's going to come in here and that's treason. You're in jail. Okay, guess what happened? Babylon came in. Why? Because that's what God said was going to happen. And when, the interesting thing to me is when Babylon came in, they let Jeremiah out. <laughs> it was the Jews that put him in prison. Babylon let him out. But, but, you know, the Babylonians gave him the option, you can go with us or you can stay here, and he stayed there in Jerusalem and in Judah. But <clears throat> right all around this time, things are happening. So you got 605 B.C., you had the first phase of the captivity. About eight years later, they had been disobedient. We just read here in 2 Chronicles 36, 11, and 12, Zedekiah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he didn't listen to Jeremiah. Look at verse 13 now. He also rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar who made him swear by God. So Nebuchadnezzar made him king and said, look, you're going to swear to me by your God, the God of heaven, that you're going to follow the rules that I give you and you're going to be loyal to Babylon. You're not going to rebel against us. Zedekiah says, I swear by God that I'll do you know, whatever the agreement was. He lied. He broke his word. Okay, so when Zedekiah rebels against Nebuchadnezzar, what happened? <laughs> well, here comes Nebuchadnezzar again. Verse 14, the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after the abominations of the heathen. That's speaking of idolatry. Verse 15, the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers rising up betimes. That means early and often and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God despised his word, misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. So in 597 they came back and you know he put down one king and put up another and, and they took more back to Babylon. So at this point you got, if I remember my numbers right, about 13 to 15,000 that have been carried away. But then Zedekiah continues to rebel. Verse 17, Therefore he brought on them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with a sword in the house of the sanctuary, had no compassion on young man, maiden, old man, him that stooped for age. He gave all into his hand, and all the vessels of the house of God, great, small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king's house, in other words, the bank account for both of those places. All these he brought to Babylon. Verse 19, They burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. Alright, so this is 586 B.C. now. In 597, Nebuchadnezzar comes back, gives them a good spanking, and basically this is your last chance. They still rebelled, so then what happens? When he came back, it was no mercy. He killed thousands of people. They took literally everything from all the people of wealth, from the king's house, from the, the treasurer of the Lord's house. They killed a whole bunch of people. They knocked down the walls of Jerusalem flat and they burned the temple. That, this would have been Solomon's temple. 
This was the end of Solomon's temple. They completely looted everything they could carry out and then they burned it to the ground. Don't you think that would be discouraging? I mean, depending on the cycle, you may agree more or agree less with whoever is the occupant of the White House. But if that were you know, somehow captured and burned to the ground, symbolically, what would that feel like as an American? Right? It, it would be devastating. It would be like, wow, okay, everything we thought we knew about our country and our security and our place in the world and all that, it's all done. Well, they, I think it was probably more so the temple than even the king's house in this time with the Jews. And it was burned to the ground. Now, God left Jeremiah there with, you know, with the people in Jerusalem. And he's continuing to speak. He said, look, I told you Babylon was coming. It happened just like God said. Now, here's what you got to do. you got to obey Babylon. All right, now, let's turn over to the book of Jeremiah for a minute. There's a method to the madness. One, if I ask you to turn pages, it helps you stay awake. But two, you know, I'm hoping that we can kind of at least start to connect the dots and then you can finish it on your own. Jeremiah chapter 42, verse number 1. All the captains of the forces and Johanan, the son of Korea, and here's all the names, uh, they came near. Verse 2, they said to Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee our supplications be accepted before thee. Pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes behold, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do. So they went to Jeremiah and said, we need help from God. And he's like, yeah, I know. Verse 4, Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you, I'll keep nothing back from you. Verse 5, They said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not, even according to all things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee unto us. Verse 6, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee. Now that sounds great, right? Whatever God says, that's what we're going to do. Let's find out if they followed through on it. Verse 7, it came to pass after how long the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah? Ten days. So I went to Jeremiah and he's like, alright, I'll pray for you and I'll, I'll see what God says. Have you ever sent a text message, waited 15 minutes, didn't get an answer, and you got antsy? Especially, depending on the phone setup that you have, sometimes it says delivered, or sometimes it says read, and they still didn't answer you. Hey, we're programmed for a now society, right? Instant. All right, you know, you give me a couple days and I'll have an answer for you. I gotta wait two days? Are you kidding me? God made them wait 10 days. Why? Because God, well, for one thing, God doesn't operate on our schedule. But for another thing, I think God was kind of testing them and he also knew what was going to happen. Are right, you really going to wait on me or not? So after 10 days, God speaks to Jeremiah. Um, verse 8, Then he called Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces, and all the people from the least to the greatest. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom you sent me to present your supplication. Verse 10, If you will abide in this land, then will I build you and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. I will show mercies unto you that he may have mercy upon you and cause you to return to your own land. But if you say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, we'll go to the land of Egypt where we will see no war nor hear the sound of the trumpet nor have hunger or bread, and there will we dwell. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord, you remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, 
If you wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt. And the famine wherever you were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there ye shall die. You think God had an idea of what they were going to do? He didn't say, hey, don't go to Edom. Don't go to Syria. Don't go to, you know, wherever. He specifically said, don't you go to Egypt. Because he knew that's exactly what the, they were thinking about. So you have, you have God's message from, uh, through the mouth of Jeremiah. Was it unclear? Was it ambiguous? I mean, it's, that's pretty straightforward, right? Stay here, serve the king of Babylon, I will show you mercy. No, that sounds great. Don't be afraid of the king of Babylon, I will show you mercy. I mean, that sounds like the exact answer to their prayers, right? And then you had a specific warning. Do not go to Egypt. Then what happened? Chapter 43, verse 1. It came to pass... When Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto the people all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah, and there's all the names, and all the proud men, saying to Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. But Baruch the son of Neriah said it thee on against us to deliver us into the hands of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captives to Babylon. So, Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. But Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the remnants of the forces took all the remnant of Judah that were returned from the nations whither they had been driven to dwell in the land of Judah, even men, women, children, and the king's daughters, and every person Nebuzar Aden, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of, the son of, the son of. Verse 7, so they came to the land of Egypt. For they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Now that's quite interesting. How much time has passed between chapter 42 and 43? Ten days, right? They went to Jeremiah and said, We need an answer from God. Tell us what God says and whatever He tells us to do, we'll do it. Ten days, God gives Jeremiah an answer. Jeremiah calls him and said, Alright, i got a message from the Lord for you. Jeremiah gets done delivering the message and it was instant. Uh-uh. You're setting us up. You're trying to get us killed by the king of Babylon. We're not doing that. We're going to Egypt. And so 10, 12 days it went from we'll do whatever God says to we're going to Egypt. What did they really mean? We'll do whatever God says as long as we like it, right? As long as what you tell me God says agrees with what I've already made up my mind to do, we'll do that. Now, none of us have ever done that, right? None of us have ever kind of predetermined, all right, this is what I want to do and I want to try to get God to sign off on it. We've never done that, right? But we've got to be careful because in this instance, what they did, who becomes the authority in that case? Was it God as the authority? Yeah, it's man. It's their own mind, their own heart. It's what I want to do. So they'd already made up their mind they were going to Egypt. So if you continue on, um, further on down, Jeremiah repeats it. Look, God, you go to Egypt, God's going to destroy you. <clears throat> and then chapter 44 and 45 and 46, he's prophesying against Egypt. Okay? What we see in the two accounts between Kings and Chronicles and Jeremiah is that when they decided to make a run for Egypt they took Jeremiah against his will and carried him away captive they dragged him down to Egypt with them he didn't want to go they took Jeremiah too forced him to be part of that traveling party now was there any other time in the history of Israel where God had told them not to go to Egypt When, they, when God brought them out, you had the Passover and you had the parting of the Red Sea, you, know, you had the, all the ten plagues on Egypt and everything, and then God brings them to Mount Sinai. Didn't God plainly tell them at that point not to go back to Egypt? Stay in this land, this is where I want you. 
I mean, they knew that from a long time ago. And then here God repeated it through the mouth of Jeremiah, stay here, don't go to Egypt. But they did. <clears throat> what did God do when they went to Egypt? Did God say, well, bless your heart, you know, you, you were sincere. What did God do? He did exactly what he said he was going to do, right? He spanked them. He judged them. He punished them. Okay. And did they escape by going to Egypt? No. Babylon came, chased them down. You know, they, they died in Egypt. They did not get what they wanted. Jeremiah was given the option by Babylon. And he stayed there in um, his homeland. Ezekiel was one that was carried away to Babylon. Ezekiel and Daniel were both carried into Babylon. It was very interesting. One of the things that <clears throat> Jeremiah said uh, was that God's going to give you captive and God's going to have you um, out of your land for 70 years to make up for all the Sabbath years that you ignored. All right, if you're in Jeremiah, turn back a couple of chapters to uh, Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. Verse 1 tells us that these are the words that Jeremiah of the letter Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the leadership. Verse 10. Right, Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Thus saith the Lord, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon. I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. That verse right there in verse 11 <clears throat> is very popular in a lot of circles today. I, mean, I like it. I have it underlined in my Bible. God says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. What is an expected end? What does that word end mean? Is that talking about death? What's it talking about? This Sunday school, I'm, I'm looking for feedback here. A, a, a plan, a purpose, a destination. You know, I've got an expected end. I've got a plan for you. Okay, that's what he's saying. He said, "I'm going to give you. I've got a plan for your life, and a, a destination. That's where we're going." That is very popular in a lot of feel-good preaching today, you know. And it's not all bad. I mean, I, I don't like feeling bad. I like to feel good. But what I'm simply trying to point out is a lot of the health, wealth, and prosperity preaching that mentions this verse over and over again ignores uh, verse ten. There's going to be 70 years in Babylon. It kind of ignores what we just read in Jeremiah 42. If you obey me, then I'll do this. If you go to Egypt, then I'm going to judge you. Okay? Um, what in the context, verse 11, in its context, it's saying, God said, I'm going to chasten you for your idolatry and your disobedience. And then after your punishment is over, I'm going to bring you back to give you an expected end. In other words, he said, I'm going to keep my promises. Didn't God promise a Messiah through um, the line of Abraham and then ultimately through the line of David? Has that happened at this point? No, I mean, at this point in time of Jeremiah, it's you know, approximately 600 B.C., give or take, you know, a little way either side. I mean, we're 600 years out from the time of Christ. So, it hasn't happened yet. God's going to bring them back, and what he's saying is, I'm going to keep my promises. And that's the comforting part. But the part that prosperity preachers, and if I can say it this way, independent Baptists, like to ignore is the chastening part. Because I don't want to think about, okay, I... I can't just do things my own way. Oh, well, God's just going to bless me because I'm a Christian, because I go to church, because I fill in the blank, right? What's God's condition for blessing consistently in Scripture? Obedience. You got it. Obedience. You nailed it. And that's, here Israel's disobedient. Okay, so 
But you have here in Jeremiah 29.10 a time frame given. God said, after 70 years are accomplished in Babylon, that's how long you're going to have to stay there, then I'll start bringing you back. Okay, now, turn a few pages to your right, back to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 this time. In Daniel chapter 1 is when they refused the king's meat. You know, Daniel chapter 2 is when he interpreted the dream. Chapter 3 is where Daniel wasn't present, but the other three refused to, to bow. You know, By the time we get to <clears throat> Daniel 4 is when ne God humbled Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 5, you have the handwriting on the wall. Daniel chapter 6 <clears throat> is where we get the den of lions. Okay, and then the, it kind of shifts to the prophetic section of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by... What's the next word? Books. So what was he doing? He was studying. Okay, He was part of the very first wave of captivity... And we're talking about almost 70 years later. So how old was he when he was studying? In his 70s or 80s. Okay, why do I point that out? Because that's got studying God's Word has got to be a lifelong pursuit for all of us. Okay, um, I understood by books the number of the years whereof the Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Verse 3, I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So what you see here is Daniel started doing the math. He was reading the book of Jeremiah, the prophecies of Jeremiah. He started doing the math and he's like, wait a minute. We're right here at the end of this 70 year time frame. And he starts praying, God, you said after 70 years we could go back. Would you make it possible? Would you work this out? I mean, by this time, what was Daniel's position in his work or politically or however you want to say it? What was his position? You know, he was well connected, right? You remember the king made 120 princes and then he had three supervisors over them. Who was the chief of those three supervisors? Daniel. I mean, so I think if he wasn't the prime minister, it was something close to that. Okay? Well, Nebuchadnezzar had promoted Daniel. And then when Babylon finally fell and they were conquered by the Medes and the Persians, the next king promoted Daniel as well. Okay? So... Daniel was well connected in the leadership politically, but it was because God knew he was going to use that for his godly influence. But see, Daniel starts praying. He says, God, 70 years is almost up. You know, would you work this out? And I think Daniel, you know, influenced Darius. Okay? Um, now, let's go back to 2 Chronicles 36. I think it's important to turn back and forth just to hopefully help us connect these stories a little bit. Second Chronicles 36 and verse 20. Them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons under the reign of the kingdom of Persia. All right, so what that's saying is those that were carried away captive stayed in Babylon the entire time Babylon remained a world empire. Who captured Babylon? The Medo-Persian Empire. Okay? Verse 21. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept her Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. There's our same number of 70 right there. Verse 22. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished... The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, and he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me and charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord is God be with him. Let him go up. Now, if you go ahead and roll over into Ezra chapter 1, you see almost that exact same wording again in the first half of Ezra chapter 1. But when Cyrus the king um, 
take, captures Babylon, one of the first things he did was to say, hey, God wants me to build him a house in Jerusalem. Who wants to go do it? You know, I'll, I will allow it and you know, we'll try to help you get there. So, was it bad in the land of Israel during you know, the time of Jeremiah? Yeah, it was bad. It was wicked. There was idolatry. There was immorality. There was disobedience to God's clear word. And what did God do as a result of that? He judged them. He put them in captivity. And he left them there an awful long time, right? Seventy years. Does that mean that God forgot about them? No. Why? I've tried to lay all this out. Now let's bring it down to today. Is our society in the United States generally godly? Not by a long shot. Is the religious section of American society truly pious, if I could say it that way? Truly desire, the not in general. I mean, how many times do we hear stories about, you know, folks, uh, you see abuse and fraud and all kinds of stuff. And there's a lot of what we would call casual Christianity in America today, right? I want to call it, use the name of Christian, but don't ask me to go to church on Sunday night or a midweek service. And, you know, I, I put 20 bucks in the offering plate last month. You know, don't ask me to do any more than that. You know what I mean? There's just a very casual commitment, not a real desire to walk with God and do what's right. Okay, so we can see some parallels. So if God allows chastening, like, okay, fine, you want to do that? Uh, Supreme Court says, yeah, this is okay. And now we've got to deal with more complications. It, we shouldn't be surprised is what I'm saying. But what we cannot do is say, oh man, God forgot about us. Or, you know, somehow or another, God's not, God's changed. God hasn't changed. And if we see blessings... God is good. If we see chastening, God is good. Okay? If we see, you know, a favorable outcomes, God's in control. We see things that we don't really want to see, God's still in control. But for those of us that have generally seen, you know, God's blessing and religious liberties and freedoms and that kind of thing, you know, we've we have sometimes, if we're not careful, sometimes we almost have a prosperity mindset, if I can say it that way. Now I realize this is the name of the town here in the church, but bear with me. You know, the prosperity preaching is, if you serve God, God will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise, right? And if you're not healthy, wealthy, and wise, then obviously, you know, you've got some sin in your life because this is what God does all the time. Does God bless? Yes. Is that the only thing He does? No. And that's the distinction. Okay? But sometimes we've just kind of come to equate things going well with, oh, well, God's in charge. We've got, we've got to understand is if things are happening now that we don't like, God's still in charge. You know, if things happen in the future, God's still in charge. God hasn't forgotten about us. And God will still continue to take care of his children. Okay? Did God forget about Jeremiah in the prison? No, when he got carried away captive to Egypt against his will, God didn't forget about him. And even after Jeremiah's death, it was a long time after his death. I mean, he had prophesied you're going to be in Babylon 70 years. And even if he lived another 20 years past that, let's just say for easy numbers sake, it was 50 years after. But 50 years after he was dead, then God validated his message by you know, letting people go back. The first half of the book of Ezra talks about that and them going back but initially and then Ezra went later but what I want us to see is when things are going well God's in control and God's good when things are not going the way we want it God's still in control and God is good Okay, and whatever was going on big picture it, with the country and the general uh, behavior God never forgot about those that were faithful to him those that served him, those that loved him, those that walked with him, God took care of them. I mean, God took care of Jeremiah in Jerusalem. God took care of Daniel in Babylon, right? God took care of Ezekiel in Babylon. And guess who else was in Babylon before getting permission to go to Jerusalem? Ezra. Guess who else was in Babylon before getting permission to go back? Nehemiah. 
And during that time, during the earlier phase led by Zerubbabel, there was 32,000 that went back. And then when Ezra and Nehemiah went back, there were more that went then. But what I'm saying is there were some people whose names we know, some people whose names we'll never know. But God took care of some of them in Jerusalem and took care of some of them in Babylon. But those that were trying to serve Him, God didn't forget their name. He didn't lose their address. And He took care of them in whatever the other circumstances He allowed. I mean, I see in this both a warning for our country, but also a comfort for us as God's children who are trying to do right, trying to live right, or in some cases thinking, what about my kids? Now, what about my grandkids? God is faithful no matter what we see as the you know, circumstances around us. So, anything you want to add to that? Any observations or comments? This is yes, this is no, this is I'm blonde. Okay. All right. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your word. And uh, thank you for the reminders, both positive and negative, that you are faithful. And you're faithful to uh, take care of us when we obey you. And you're faithful to chasten us when we don't. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to, um, to serve you faithfully and to trust you, whether we see how it's going to turn out or whether we don't. We pray now for your blessings on the services to come. We ask you to meet with us in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen.